if you read the title to things on your personal that Jordan puts out for you to make notes on in the back, I think it's entitled something like, It's That Time of Year. And the time of year in which modesty becomes a question. And so I'd like for us to think about that just a little bit this moment, this morning. I don't know about you. While the book would not contain it, it'd be nice if we had a list of do's and don'ts. So we could check the list. But that's not how God communicated with us. He did communicate with us through his word. But in his word, he gave us principles to think about and to leave us to make our applications. In the Old Testament, they took some of those things and made their own hedges about them. For example, you would have the law, the rabbis would have written that had been delivered by Moses to keep the Sabbath holy. They would have understood that. But what they did was they took that beyond. They took that beyond what Moses had said. And they added their own stipulations to that. That you can only go so far a distance on the Sabbath without having violated the Sabbath and traveling on the Sabbath or even working on the Sabbath. But even then, there were exceptions to what they made with regard to working on the Sabbath. Moses will talk about the ox in the ditch that they have. If they had an ox in the ditch, it was fine for them to work to get the ox out of the ditch, and that was not called work. But you can do something else that was less benign, and that was called work, and that was a violation. And truthfully, if we're not careful, we can do the very same thing. And so when we come to a passage like 1 Timothy chapter 2, 9 through 10, maybe it's not the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear that passage, but at least a thing that pops into our mind sooner or later is, oh, this is the passage that is going to use to tell us how high is high, how low is low, how tight is tight, how short is short. The truth of the matter is, this is not a clothing passage. And if it is a clothing passage, it's not a clothing passage that has to do with how little a person has on, but how much a person puts on. And so when you read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, he says, Therefore I desire that men pray, verse 8, everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety. The old King James uses the word there I really like as opposed to propriety, shamefastness. And moderation, and again the old King James uses the word sober-minded. Not with braided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly clothing, but which is proper. Women professing godliness with good works. Again, if it is a clothing passage, it has to do with the gaudiness of dress. The passage is really a passage that looks at the character. And here it's addressed to women. And yes, dress does enter into his illustration of the kind of character a woman needs to have as she presents herself in dress. And so we do look at it that way. But I want to reemphasize, this is a passage that I think is far, far, far more demanding to think about and apply for us than just simply give me the inches. You tell me the do and the don't of how I should dress. Because I don't want to violate it. I don't want to go to hell, so you tell me what I can't do. But the Lord gives us something that is far more exacting, far more emphatic and far more impressive than that and so i'll work through this passage with you for a little bit this morning and then as we go through try to make some applications along the way 
The first thing I'd like to look at you, I'd like to look at some words that are here. First of all, he says in verse 9, In like women, in like manner that women adorn themselves in modesty or in modest apparel. The word adorn and the word modest are the same words. The word modest here is not how we normally refer to modesty when we talk about modesty. The word adorn and modesty is the word for cosmos. When we look at this universe, we see order. We don't see chaos. And so when you think about how God arranged things, he put everything in their order, in their place. He did not just leave things to operate chaotically, without order. And so if you put the word order here, you like women also, that women order themselves in orderly apparel. And he will come down to verse 10 and use the word, but which is proper. What he says is, is that when a woman gets herself ordered, arranged, adorned, let that order be proper. Let that order fit. If you go to a police lineup, and the police lineup, here comes a person with a black leather jacket, chains hanging down to their knees, long hair, and wear and rides a Harley Davidson. But what you're asked to pick out of the lineup is. I want you to choose out of the lineup which one of these men had themselves adorned to be a Christian. Probably not in our first, second, or third round are we going to choose that man. However, if we are asked to find the one that is ordered that fits hell's angels, quite readily, we'll say, that's the man. Now, is there anything wrong with riding a Harley Davidson? No. Anything wrong with wearing a black leather jacket? No. Anything wrong with chains dangling down to your knees? No. But when you get all those ordered, adorned, they do paint a particular picture of the kind of person you're talking about. And so he says, when you have yourself ordered, let it be proper. The word suitable is companion there. Let it be suitable. Paul will say in this to Timothy and to Titus, speak proper words for sound doctrine. Speak suitable words that befit sound doctrine. There are words that are suitable for sound doctrine, that are proper for sound doctrine. In Genesis chapter 2, whenever God looks at man and he finds that man is alone, he's going to provide for man a help meet suitable for him, one that fits him one that's proper for him. And so when he says here, adorn yourself in modest apparel, when a woman gets herself ordered and arranged, adorned to present herself, it should be suitable. It should be proper for something. Is there something in the text that gives us the key to what is suitable? If I were to ask you, if I had a whiteboard and ask you, I want you to write in ascending numbers from 1 to 10. And you would write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If I ask you to write 
odd numbers from 1 to 10. You go 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. If I ask you to write in descending order from 10 to 1, you go 10, 9, 7, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. How did you know to order that? How did you know what the order was? If I just said, order some numbers, I want you to come up here and arrange some numbers. Just arrange them. You would know how to arrange them. There had to be some trigger there, didn't there? There had to be something that was there that, that triggered the order that was there. Whether it's ascending, descending, even or odd. There had to be something to trigger the order that's suitable to raise the numbers. Or there's something in the text that gives us an indication as to what is suitable and how to arrange a yourself suitably. Again, if we come back to what he says in verse 10, first part of verse 9, in like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, verse 10, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. What's the order? What is proper? What is suitable to the order? A woman befitting, here's the key, godliness. When a woman orders or arranges herself, that order or arrangement should be suitable, proper, fitting for godliness. Godliness is not godlikeness. Godliness has to do with a respect for God. And so when he talks about when a woman orders or arranges herself, it is to be fitting respect for God. In Genesis chapter 38, you have the story of Judah, who has three sons. Two sons have died. And Judah says to Tamar, I'm not giving you the third boy. Number one, he's not old enough to bear a child, and I'm not giving him to you because first time shame on me, second time shame on you. I've lost two, I'm not losing three. And so she puts on her widow's garments. But when Judah tells her, you can't have my son, she takes off her widow's garments and then makes herself suitable to be a harlot. She puts on the veil of a harlot. It doesn't say Tamar is now a harlot, but she puts on arrangement of things that do not befit a widow, but befit one who is a harlot. And Judah goes into her, and she becomes with child. Now, there's a lot of things we can explore about that, but that's not the point of the lesson. The point is, I want you to see what the trigger is. The indication there is, she put a veil on like a harlot. That was the way she ordered herself. In Proverbs chapter 7, in Proverbs chapter 7, you have the story here of a young man. He's worse than Barney Five. Barney Five would have more sense than this young man. I mean, falling off the turnip truck would have been a compliment for him. He's void of understanding. Uh, he, he, a, a doorpost would have more sense. And he's like hanging around the corner from hell here. And totally void of understanding. And so it says in verse 6, For at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice and saw among the simple... I perceived among the youths a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house in the twilight and the evening, in the black and the dark, and the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and crafty of heart. When this woman meets him, how is she arranged? What 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 triggers? What is the trigger point for how she arranges herself here? Does it say here that she, here's a woman that met him with the attire of godliness? 
No, she met him, what? With the attire of a harlot. Now, it doesn't say this woman is a prostitute. She has a husband. He's got a bag of money. He's gone a long way. But she's going to do what a harlot does, so she uses the tools a harlot uses to accomplish what a harlot is to accomplish. She adorned or arranged herself in the attire of what? Of who? A harlot. You see the trigger there. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31 now. In Proverbs chapter 31. When you think about this virtuous woman that is presented here. And you read as she begins to be described about how she is clothed. Look at verse 25 and what it says. Strength and honor are her clothing. She rejoices in time to come. When you read of a woman, it says, strength and honor are her clothing. Do you think of the attire of a harlot? Do you think of the attire of someone that is playing a harlot like Tamar? Or you hear a woman that is described whose clothing is strength and honor. Do you hear a, the indication of here's a woman who has some respect for God? Strength and honor are her clothing. This woman is not searching for the attention of a man. This woman is searching for the attention of a gentle man. There's a difference between a gentleman and a man. A gentleman will respect a lady. And a gentleman will respect the privacy and the person of a lady. And a gentleman will respect when a lady adorns herself as fits godliness. A man's not interested in that. And a woman's not interested in presenting herself as Proverbs chapter 31 speaks of. And so when you begin to think about this idea of how do we arrange ourselves? How do I know how to order my clothing? How do I know to order myself? He says, as befits godliness. As befits a woman who has a respect for God, who is showing strength and honor to God by the way she arranges herself. That's one set of words to look at. The second set of words to look at is, as I read, with propriety or shamefastness. We'll use the word shamefast today. But if I, if I use the word bedfast, if I would say so-and-so is bedfast, what would we normally conclude? What would we conclude right off? We'd say, well, here's someone who is bound to the bed. Here's someone who is governed to the bed. Here's someone who is bound or controlled by the bed. Well, when you have shame fast, here's a person who is governed, ruled, or controlled by a sense of shame. And so when she orders and arranges herself, as befits godliness, a part of befitting godliness is the kind of shame, sense of shame that she has. I think it's not an overstatement. And I think it's not a statement of intel great intelligence to observe. That by and large, that's being kind about it. We live in a world, not just the United States, but including the United States, we live in a world where a sense of shame has been absolutely lost. There is no sense of shame. It's kind of like what Jeremiah wrote in chapter 6 and verse 15. At a time when they could not blush, when we reach the condition in our character that we can no longer blush at something, we've lost a sense of shame about us. And so when Paul talks about this to Timothy, he says a woman that befits God in this is a woman who's going to have a sense of of what? A sense of shame about her. You can tell by the way she orders and arranges herself. You can tell something about the kind of character and the heart she has that she has a sense of shame to her. Turn to the book of Ephesians just a moment. Might put your marker there in 1 Timothy 2. We'll come back. Don't you see something in a, in a, as, a, as a progressive thought here for just a moment? Look at verse 17 of Ephesians 4. 
This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling, they've lost a sense of blush, had given themselves over to licentiousness, they've lost a sense of shame, to work all uncleanness with greediness. You know, the first time we try something, we may be an at it. Maybe the first time that is there, we, we say, oh, I didn't feel good about doing that. And the more we keep doing it, we begin to say, oh, I feel comfortable about doing that. That doesn't bother me. I know this is outdated. But for those of us who are old enough to understand what a stick shift is, and understand how you have to coordinate the clutch and the shifting, you remember what it was like the first couple of attempts you had to do when you tried to operate the clutch. You remember its first year and you got led out to go and you remember how it automatically died on you because you didn't have the secret, it was not synchronized there? Or you remember how when you first did it, it kind of bunny hopped a few times and then died on you? And then finally you were sick and tired of it, so you gassed it and you let off the clutch and then you burned the tires all the way out across the intersection? And then what happens? Pretty soon you can drive a stick shift and not even think about it. You can just operate that clutch, shift those gears, and it becomes second nature to you. Well, that's kind of what Paul is saying here. Here there comes a time, it begins with a hardness of heart, and then he says, they're past feeling. And then they give themselves over to lascivious. That, that word lascivious, we don't use a lot. Licentious is another term that is used there. That's not a term we use a lot, but the, the idea of lascivious or licentiousness is acting without restraint, without, well, acting with wantonness. They're the attributes of it, but that's the simplest term. Here is someone who now is past feeling, and they just give themselves over to restraint, but not only do they go without, without restraint, they do it greedily. I mean, it's something they lust after, they drive after, they pursue, and they do it with greed. And so here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, you have the description of the character of a woman who is bound or guttered by a sense of shame. She befits a woman that is shame fast. The problem with immodesty is not the response. The problem with immodesty is a lack of shame because it is scandally, oftentimes, next to nothing. Or it is scantily revealing. And so he talks about this idea of a sense of shame. Going back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we see another word that is given here. And that is the word moderation or sober-minded. The idea of sober-minded is here's a person that doesn't treat this flippantly. Here is a person who looks at this and takes this seriously. Here is a woman who, when she orders and arranges herself, not only do you see that she is presenting herself as a woman fitting godliness, a respect for God with strength and honor. Here also is a woman whose character can be seen in how she orders herself that befits a person bound or governed by a sense of shame. And here you can tell is a woman who has a sense of serious mindedness about how she orders and arranges herself. She's not light or flippant about it. She is very careful not to reveal herself in any kind of way to expose herself to produce a response that might be lustful on the part of some, some individual. She's very serious about it. Sober-minded does not mean you have no fun. Sober-minded doesn't mean you can't laugh. 
Sober mind does not mean you can't enjoy life. Sober mind does not mean you live like a monk, removed from society somewhere, and all you do is sit around and hum for 24 and a half hours a day. Notice I said 24 and a half. You get an extra half when you hum. The idea of sober minded is here's someone who is very serious about this. So when you paint that picture and you want to talk about a woman that presents herself to respect God, are we going to have to talk about how low is low, how tight is tight, how high is high, how short is short? and go on down the line? Or can we talk about someone that has a sense of shame and someone that has a sense of sober-mindedness? Now, I may be criticized for this. I recognize what I'm fixing to say is my judgment. I may be criticized for this. In the past, when I have preached on this, I think I got in describing this about as close to X-rated as you could get and still be legal. And I've decided I'm not doing that. It's not my responsibility to tell you what scanty is. It's not my responsibility to tell you what a lack of shame is. It's not my responsibility to tell you what a lack of sober-mindedness is. But ladies, you can tell and you know when you arrange yourself how revealing you are and your husband knows how revealing you are, then I would just ask, are you befitting godliness with a sense of shame and serious-mindedness about that? Now, let me add a connoisseur of this. This is not just about women. This is about men, too. When you have a man whose clothes looks like he's been sprayed on there so tight he's like a, a stud on the hunt, listen. He hasn't got an order like he's a man befitting godliness. When you see these people running their tutu at these men in running their tutu down the highway here, and they got their shirts off. That's not to stay cool. You don't stay cool running. I don't care how much you have on or how little you take off. You don't stay cool. You get hot. That doesn't mean you can't run. But when you do, we ought to have a sense of shame about how we present ourselves and a sense of sober-mindedness about that about how we go about befitting godliness. You see, this respect for God is far more imposing than giving a do or don't. It's far more encompassing and far more demanding than that. Because you see, with the measure of the ruler, we go by the measure of the ruler and I don't want to violate the measure of the ruler. If I violate the measure of the ruler, then I have sinned. No, there's something more grave and serious about that, this. And that is, how do I befit godliness and show my character is governed by a sense of shame and serious-mindedness about this? Is that hard? Is it hard for us to understand have we said something in the words here that is so complicated that we're going to have a Greek, need a Greek theologian to explain the words to us? I think most of us understand this. And so I'd just like to close with a couple of considerations just for you to think about regarding this. If this sounds somewhat like a repeat to the choices classes, to those who've been the choices class, then you have been listening well. Because it is. 
And there's some things that Jordan and I in that choices class laid down as parameters for making decisions about things like this. I just like to close with these thoughts. Number one, am I committed to the Lord? Am I committed to His Word? Am I committed to His will? Notice I didn't say, am I committed to a specific commandment? Because His will is much broader than a specific commandment. If I know the will of God, I may not find the specific commandment, but I know the will of God. Am I committed to His will? Jesus said it this way, I do always all things that please the Father. Am I committed to the Lord? Am I committed to His Word? Am I committed to His will? The second thing, what is right? Am I committed to what is right? Am I going to start right and stay right and not move from right until the ground I know I'm moving to is right? I may have a question about how I present myself over here. I'm not sure if this befits godliness or not, but I know this befits godliness and a sense of shame and a sense of serious mindedness. Now, I may learn that this does befit that, and so then I may enjoin that as a part of my order and arrangement. But until I do, I'm going to start right and stay right, not move from right until the ground I know I'm moving to is right. Am I committed to what is right? Because I'm committed to the Lord, and I'm committed to His Word, and I'm committed to His will. And then I have to ask myself, what impact will I have on others, and how will it affect my influence with others? And about the time I've gotten to this point, there's usually a lady, usually some older lady that comes out, usually not a younger lady, usually an older lady that comes out and says, well, you, just, you men just need to pay attention to how you look. And so it's not our fault, it's not the women's fault, it's the men's fault, and you need to pay attention to where you put your eyes. Okay, I agree. We need to pay attention to where we put our eyes. We need to be careful about having bouncing eyes, too. Job said, I'm going to try to protect my eyes. Yes. But isn't this a coupling together? That men try to protect their eyes, but women, you help us protect our eyes? by not putting before us the opportunity to stumble because there may be something revealing that we don't need to lust after? Is that possible? So am I aware of the impact I'm going to have? Am I going to be the kind of lady presenting God that's suitable for God in this that others can look at, mothers can look at and say, you see her, that is a woman who befits godliness, and you can tell her sense of shame, and you can tell she's serious about that. I want you to be like her. I want you to pay attention to how she orders herself. Am I committed to the Lord? Am I committed to His Word and His will? Am I committed to what is right? Am I committed to asking the question, what will the impact of my appearing, adorning myself like this, have on somebody else? In close, I'd like to revisit Ephesians chapter 5 that Jordan touched on in the 9 o'clock period so well. And again, I just appreciate Jordan's lessons so much that he did on this. I appreciate he's walking through Ephesians chapter 5 with us this morning as well. The words he had to say were just powerful. But I want to emphasize what Jordan said in one more thing here. In verse 1, Therefore be followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, 
but not be named among you as is fitting for the saint. He said there's a way saints walk. There's a fit walk for saints. And when he says walk in love as Christ loved us, he did not have to give every detail involved in that. Because if we understand how Christ loved us and how Christ presented himself to us, then how he loved us and how we walk in love as he walked is going to be fitting for saints. But what he says, these other things are not fitting for saints. So I have to ask myself, am I so interested in style today that style is now my standard? You know, my use, the style was to streak. You would have people that would completely become naked and they'd run across the campus or they'd run across the football field. So the greatest tackles were when someone streaked across the football field and they got leveled by the linebacker. What that became the standard for us? Would that standard be fitting godliness? Well, you say that's ridiculous. I know that's ridiculous. I know that's, I know that's reasoning from the absurd. Absolutely, it's reasoning from the absurd. But style's not our standard. And ladies, here's where I hurt for you. Style of the people who style clothes, they don't think about how a woman is going to present herself godly. All they think about is how can we arrange this so when she gets it ordered, it reveals herself in whatever way it is. You know, when I go to dealers and buy a suit on sale, I really don't have to worry about it. Is it going to be too tight? That's just not a problem for men's clothing. But both men and women need to be governed by a sense of godliness in how and how we arrange ourselves before God and others. So you enjoy your summer. Just be aware somebody's watching you. And just be aware you still must arrange yourself as someone befitting godliness with a sense of shame and sober-mindedness. If you need to be right with God in some way this morning, we've not talked about salvation anyway, but if you need to be right with God in some way this morning, we would ask you to come while we stand and while we sing. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can, but thank you for connecting with us.